Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. With the significant increase in interest rates over the past year, and with the home buying and selling season right around the corner, I thought it would be great to have our resident mortgage expert on the show to go over the implications of this higher interest rate environment. Whether you're getting a new mortgage or are considering refinancing, we tackle whether you should go with a variable rate or fixed rate mortgage in this current interest rate environment. There could also be some new mortgage rules coming out this spring as well, so we cover what those are so that you can be better prepared. You might have also been experiencing quite a bit of a payment shock if you hold a variable rate mortgage with a drastic increase in your monthly mortgage payments. And if you're a fixed rate mortgage holder, then you're not out of the woods either as when your mortgage inevitably comes up for renewal, you might very well be forced into a much higher rate on your new mortgage than what you've been used to over the past few years. We're going to cover this new challenge that you may be facing with these higher rates, along with some things you can do to lower your monthly mortgage payments despite these increases in rates. Our guest today is the show's resident mortgage expert, Sean Cooper. It's who I go to and who I send friends and family to for any mortgage-related questions. Sean is the best-selling author of the book, Burn Your Mortgage, The Simple, Powerful Path to Financial Freedom for Canadians. He bought his first house when he was only 27 in Toronto and paid off his mortgage in just three years by age 30. These days, Sean's helping others burn their mortgage as an independent mortgage broker. Now, before we dive into the interview, Sean has offered to answer for free any questions that you, the Build Wealth Canada listeners, have. I've set up a special page for him, so all you have to do is go to buildwealthcanada.ca slash Sean. That's buildwealthcanada.ca slash Sean, S-E-A-N. And there you can actually send him a message with your questions, or if you prefer, you can even pick a time on his calendar for a phone or video call to get your questions answered with him live for free. So Sean is a licensed mortgage broker too. So I definitely also encourage you to reach out to him if you're also looking to get a new mortgage or if your mortgage is coming up for renewal, as at the very least, he'll be able to provide you with a short list of the best mortgages that he's been able to find across all of Canada from the 60 plus lenders that he monitors. None of this costs you anything and there's no obligation to get your mortgage through him or use any of those suggested mortgages. So at the very least, you'll get some good education and research on the top mortgages available in Canada right now. You'll learn what to look for when choosing your next mortgage, and you can always decide later whether you'd like him to help you with the process, or if you just want to do it all yourself, it doesn't cost you anything regardless, but at least you've got that that research and that data that you need to make a decision. So that link again to get in touch with Sean, to get your questions answered, and get his research on some of the best mortgages in Canada that he's been able to find is over at Build Wealth Canada dot ca slash sean that's buildwealthcanada.ca slash sean s-e-a-n and now let's get into the episode all right sean welcome back to the show hi cornell it's great to be on the podcast again so sean in 2022 the bank of canada raised interest rates eight times the prime rate went up a whopping four percent and so far we have already seen one increase of the prime rate in 2023 As someone that's in the industry, what are you hearing and what do you think is in store for mortgage rates in 2023, 2024, and beyond? Yes. I wish that I could say I had a crystal ball and (laughs) could predict exactly what's going to happen, but I do read the tea leaves and do read a lot of reports from economists. So I have an idea about what is expected to happen, but what's expected to happen and what actually happens can differ there. But yes. 2022 was quite an eventful year there. I mean, we saw, as you mentioned, prime rate go up a whopping 4% after the Bank of Canada had put out a statement like a little over a a year earlier saying that it believed interest rates would remain low for a, quote, very long time, which didn't end up happening because of the inflation situation. Because when 
inflation is going up, the cost of, of goods and, and services are going up. The main tool that the Bank of Canada has to control that is by raising interest rates. That's the main reason that we saw this aggressive increase in rates so that the inflation doesn't become permanent in the economy. But yes, it definitely wasn't a fun time to be a borrower with a mortgage, especially those with variable rate mortgages, which I could speak firsthand from my clients. Some of them saw their mortgage payments go up by more than a thousand dollars a month because of this increase there. So it's definitely good that the stress has to exist there just to make sure that people can handle it. But I don't think people expected the payments to go up as quickly as they did. Now, the good news that I have is it looks like the interest rate increases will be slowing down, if not stopping here. We've kind of reached the top of the rates now. Again, I don't have any inside knowledge. I'm not best friends with the Bank of Canada governor or anything like that. But from Reading the reports from the economists, they're basically saying that we're towards the upper end. And this rate increase that we saw in January quarter point, it looks like it could be the last rate increase in terms of the prime rate. So that's good news, certainly for borrowers there. And we can kind of get used to this as being the new normal in terms of interest rates. And we could possibly see rates falling depending on if and when we see this recession and how severe it ends up being. I mean, I hope that we don't have a severe recession. That's not a good situation, but it's kind of a wait and see game to see how if we end up having the recession and how mild or severe it ends up being, that will really determine where rates go. But I would say the good thing is that people can get used to these interest rates being stable for now. And this is kind of the new reality. And I would just move forward based on these mortgage rates. And at least it provides people with predictability and stability, which I definitely wasn't the case in 2022 there. So that is some good news. The different brokers and companies that are in this industry, do they have any sort of insider knowledge that the Bank of Canada gives them to let them know about the intentions? Or is it more so The Bank of Canada does what they think is best, and that everyone in the mortgage industry, just anyone that has anything to do with interest rates, sort of try to analyze and speculate what's going to happen and plan accordingly, depending on possible outcomes. But nobody really knows too much. Is it pretty sort of not very open in terms of Bank of Canada and their communication in regards to their intentions, or is it the opposite? Well, the Bank of Canada, I would say it's not like they just get up there and talk for 10 minutes and that's it. They put out reports and you can read further commentary in terms of that there. I definitely think the Bank of Canada needs to do a better job of speaking and as well as writing in layperson, like simple terms so that the average Canadian can understand because people always joke about how it's written in almost financial Shakespearean with how (laughs) difficult it is to understand and, and read the tea leaves and all that. So especially with I would say confidence in the Bank of Canada, the shakiest it's ever been because yeah, people remember that statement from the Bank of Canada and they made their financial decisions based on that there about them saying rates would remain low for a very long time. So I think people are just a bit perturbed about what ended up happening there. So I definitely think transparency is key and they need to do a better job. But to answer their question, yes, there are reports and other things that they put out, but Nobody knows what's going to happen when the Bank of Canada governor steps up to the podium and announces the interest rate. We have an idea about what expected to happen, but yeah, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, whether rates are going to change or not. I mean, people, economists make predictions and yeah, many times they're correct, but sometimes we get thrown a curveball there. So wish I knew exactly what was going to happen. I have an idea about what is going to happen, but I can't predict exactly what all the different rate changes or non-changes are going to be happening in the the next year or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like for us, regular Canadians, someone like myself, who's not in the mortgage industry, nothing like that. It seems like like you said, there's some hints that they might give. There's some reports that they do that may communicate which way they are maybe leaning but with that said, there's no one knows for sure. And so I think that I think that's a good warning 
or kind of a flag to raise for all the listeners is that if somebody is claiming that they know exactly what's going to happen and saying, oh, you should do X because the rates are about to go up or they're going to go down, there is no 100% way that someone could possibly know that with absolute certainty. And so I guess that's kind of like a red flag where, okay, maybe this person is a little bit overconfident. They're trying to probably sell me something. It sounds like it's a lot about just probabilities where, okay, the Bank of Canada said X, Y, Z. So that's leading us to believe that there's a higher chance they may do this particular thing, like raise them more or decrease them, but realizing that we don't know for sure and anything could happen. And so to sort of arrange our financial lives in such a way where no matter what happens, we're still going to be okay. So for example, not taking on such a large mortgage because, oh, I was told that the rates are going to go down, so we'll be fine. And kind of counting on that, and then it doesn't happen. And then now you're struggling to meet those monthly mortgage payment obligations. Do you think that is a practical, safe way to approach it just as a regular Canadian? Yes, exactly. You should take the stress test seriously and make sure you can actually, even though on your mortgage statement, it says you're only paying maybe $2,500 a month, whatever you're being stress tested at, like the payment, if it's $3,200 or whatever it is, make sure you can afford those Payments there. I mean, I guess if you're in a fixed rate mortgage, you're more protected there because you're guaranteed that rate and payment. But especially if you're taking like a adjustable rate or like variable rate mortgage, people call that. But basically, a, a mortgage where the payment can change based on changes to the prime rate. Just be careful there because yes, it looks like rates are going to stay flat and perhaps fall in the future there, but. Who knows? Nobody predicted COVID. Who knows what kind of unexpected things will happen? The interest rate predictions are based on what we know at this point in time, but nobody predicted a once in a century global pandemic. So there seems to be a lot of these surprises that come up here that nobody is expecting. So I would definitely be ready for the unexpected and make sure that you can handle it from any shocks from a financial standpoint there. It's it's very important because once in a century, events seem to be happening more than once in a century. So certainly it is important to be prepared for unexpected financial events. Mm -hmm. And with all these mortgage rate changes that we've seen in the recent past, what are some considerations when choosing between a fixed rate and a variable rate mortgage? Yes, certainly. As I alluded to earlier about people with the adjustable rate mortgage, seeing their payment over a thousand dollars a month. That's certainly it's fun to have that. You really understand if you're right for that product when you have when the rates are going up. It was great during COVID when people saw their mortgage rates plummet to like one percent. So that was fun, but it's not as fun when you see your mortgage payment and rate go up. So yeah, that was certainly kind of a good test for a lot of people with that product there. So I would say that It really depends on your tolerance for risk and how you felt over the last while. Like if you can't, I would say if you're at the upper end right now and in terms of affordability and you have an adjustable rate mortgage and you just don't want to stomach any more increases, then you might consider switching to a true variable rate mortgage, which means that a true variable rate mortgage is a variable rate mortgage where your payment is fixed and it does not change. Now, the potential downside to that is that if you do not choose to increase your payment, it will potentially stretch out the length of time that it takes for you to pay off your mortgage in full and cost you more interest. But the benefit of that is that from a cash flow standpoint, it's a lot easier to predict because your mortgage payment stays fixed and it's up to you whether or not you increase your payment there. Now it's fixed to a point. We did have situations where a lot of people were hitting what's called their trigger point, where basically what happens if mortgage rates go up so much that your mortgage payment, which remains fixed, does not cover the interest only portion of your mortgage. It is not enough to do that. Then you have to increase your payment. But I would say the risk of that are slim to none because We're at the upper end of rate increases right now. And as long as nothing changes, then the chance of that is slim to none. So I would say if you just can't handle the increases anymore, then you might consider switching to a variable rate with a fixed payment or even a fixed rate because you're able to lock in to a fixed rate. It's kind of funny. Variable rate is actually 
priced at about 1.2% higher than fixed rates. So unless you think that there's going to be a recession and moderate to severe one, it actually can make a lot of sense to go with a fixed rate because you can actually get a fixed rate in the 4% range right now, high 4%. So if the payments are too high for you in terms of the variable rate and you're looking for some more stability there, then it can make sense to switch to a fixed rate or like a variable rate with the fixed payment. So I would definitely say speak with a mortgage professional like myself, and I'd be more than happy to provide you some different scenarios, rates and payments so that you can make an informed decision there. Because yes, certainly I don't think anyone thought their mortgage payment would go up by more than a thousand dollars a month. And I do know people who are towards their upper end there because the stress tests you at plus 2%, but if rates go up 4%, you're not stress tested at that. So yes, definitely I feel your pain. And if you are looking for some solutions from a cash flow standpoint, uh, certainly feel free to reach out. There's opportunities to stretch out your amortization period to lower your payment, all sorts of things, which we will discuss later on there. But yes, definitely opportunities to fix your situation if you're feeling that it's tight from a cash flow standpoint. Mm -hmm. So in those cases with this third type of mortgage you mentioned with the variable, but where your monthly payments stay the same, but you basically is it your amortization period, I guess, would be what increases if the rates go up. So you're still exactly. taking the same cash flow hit every month. So that's very interesting. It's like you have the stability sort of of the fixed rate mortgage, but you get to take advantage of rates if they drop further. But then of course, the downside is that your amortization period could get longer and longer and longer. So you're actually paying more in total interest if you look at it that way. So yeah, it's nice at least to know that option exists. And I can see it making sense for some people for sure. Yeah, exactly. that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think most people have heard of the traditional fixed and traditional variable, but it's nice to know that there is this other version as well that may be a good fit. That's great. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. There are so many opinions on how to invest your money today, but it can be hard to find credible voices to rely on in the world of finance and investing. One resource that I turn to every week is the ETF Market Insights YouTube channel led by today's episode sponsor, BMO ETFs. Market Insights brings in industry experts and the weekly episodes cover the hottest themes like inflation, infrastructure, healthcare, and more. Tuning in helps me stay up to date on what's happening so I can be a smarter investor. And you can also submit your own ETF questions to be answered on the show. So do yourself a favor and subscribe on YouTube to ETF Market Insights or visit ETFMarketInsights.com so you can be notified when future episodes go live. And now back to the show. What's happening in the real estate market right now? So the first quarter of 2023, which is when we're recording this episode, and is now a good time to buy a home? Is it more of a seller's market? Is it more of a buyer's market? Can you give us a bit of a take on that? I know it's a bit situational depending on geography, where in Canada we're talking about, but I think generally like what you're seeing with interest rates, I'm sure there's like sort of macro level insight that you have on that. Of course. I mean, I'm not a realtor myself, but I have a lot of realtors that I work with as my close partners there. So definitely I wouldn't expect the price increases like we saw in 2021. 2022, I would say in the first six months, we were seeing decent price appreciation, but it really slowed down and we're seeing prices come down after the aggressive interest rate increases by the Bank of Canada there. Now, I've heard from some home buyers that interest rates are higher, uh, mortgage payments would be higher. Maybe it doesn't make sense to buy a home, but I would argue it's actually a better market now to buy a home than before. And the reason for that is interest rates go higher. That means that home prices come down. So you're actually able to, even though your mortgage payments are higher, it's offset by the lower home prices there. So you're able to kind of get more bang for your home buying dollar. And also, I mean, I don't know about you, Cordell and other people, but if I was a home buyer in the market before, it's not fun when you see a home that you like and then you're up against 25 other people in some crazy bidding war. And you have to literally make a snap decision for the single biggest purchase in your lifetime. Like you literally have to decide in like half an hour whether you want to put in an offer, how much. And I went through that myself because that's how the market was when I bought my house 10 years ago. But it wasn't a fun situation to go through. I mean, the good news is that things are a lot more 
balanced now. I would say it's like a balanced market or some regions of the country. It might even be like a buyer's market, but I would say it's pretty well balanced, which means that as a home buyer, you have a lot more negotiating power. You're able to negotiate on the price because there aren't as many people that you're up against. And also you're able to better protect yourself from condition standpoint. Like before it was very hard to include condition of financing and home inspection. But now if you're the only one making the offer on the property, you can get away with including those there. And yeah, unfortunately, I really like British Columbia because they introduced like for even for resale properties, there's like a cooling off period. I'm not sure if you've heard of this Cornell, but there's like, I believe it's a 10 day cooling off period where it's for resale homes as well. It's not just new homes. Like if you're able to basically, if you change your mind at all, you're able to get out of the contract within 10 days of signing the purchase agreement. And that gives you enough time to do the home inspection and get the mortgage financing in place. Whereas other provinces like Ontario doesn't have that, which is disappointing there. So the good news is with this better balanced market, you're able to make better financial decisions, not be in such a rush. And yeah, until Ontario and other provinces follow BC's lead, like hopefully they do that. I would like to see them do that there. But until they do, you're able to have a better chance opportunity of including those conditions there because downside is when you are purchasing a home in a seller's market and you try to include those conditions, it can end up costing you the property because if other people are coming in without conditions and you're including conditions, it just makes your offer that much less attractive and seeing situations from first hand where people actually homeowners accept offers for less money because they don't include any conditions, their firm offers. So yeah, it can really put you like, I'm not saying that you should go all in necessarily and not do your due diligence. But yeah, like you have to be careful with the conditions there. Whereas now, if you're not up against 10 other people, you can include those conditions and people are, and the homeowners are more willing to accept that there. So I definitely, like, it's not fun to have higher mortgage rates, but I would honestly, if I was a home buyer, I would prefer to be buying in this market just because you can take your time, make a well-informed decision, include those conditions to protect yourself. And yes, this is a more pleasant overall process and and you don't have to make snap decisions either. Yeah. A lot less stressful as well, because you're not buying this house with no home inspection. And then you're just crossing your fingers that there will be no surprises. And I mean, those surprises could be tens of thousands of dollars potentially, but you might not know that. Right. So exactly. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that, Sean, how it is at least gone back to this norm, or at least like, like you said, it depends on the areas, but it's really nice to hear that things like home inspections conditional fund financing that these things are becoming normal again because they should be normal. I remember, you know, whenever we bought our house in the past, we didn't have to deal with these crazy markets. And I would never even have considered buying a house without contingent on financing and home inspection. I mean, that's that's such an important caveat. And I remember reading about this to death because I used to be into real estate investing and kind of one of the main rules was always always make it contingent on home inspection. Always because that alone can just totally blow things up financially if you, you know, there's like mold in the house in the attic or, you know, something like that. And now you need to get it fixed. I mean, it can become such a big thing. And so it really, I mean, I was getting stressed for other people buying houses just because I hear about these bidding wars and it's like your offer won't even get considered if it's contingent on a home inspection. And I mean, to me, that's just part of due diligence. You need to do that before you purchase home because you don't know what's going on. So very well said. With the house. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm I'm very relieved that we're at least moving back to that norm a little bit where people can actually do their due diligence and not take on this massive amount of stress where they're bidding so much for this property because they're in a bidding war and they have nothing to really fall back on in terms of home inspection. So great. Yeah. So thank you for that update. I heard there could be some new mortgage rules coming out in the spring as well. Can you tell us about these and how they may affect buyers? Sure. I I like to describe the new mortgage rules as closing the barn doors after the animals have already escaped because <laughs> it seems the regulators are always late to the the party the the game when it comes to these mortgage rules they don't seem to be forward thinking they seem to always realize oh you know maybe we should have tinkered this in the past but they're always late with these rule changes so yes and I'm not a big like I definitely in favor of protecting the overall finances of the country and all that but 
I'm just not a big fan of overcomplicating things for people. Like there's so many, it was so easy when I bought a property back in the day, there was no stress test. It, you just plunked in numbers in a calculator. It was easy to figure out how much you qualify for. Now there's a stress test and it's just not easy for the average person to figure out like how much they might qualify for. There's 25, 30 year amortizations, there's all sorts of different rules. So I mean, it's great to work with a mortgage professional like myself. It's, it's definitely paid. It, it's great for people reaching out to me, but just for the average home buyer, it's not as easy as it once was. So yes, when the regulator OSFI puts out Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, they're basically like the regulators for all federal lenders across the country, which is the majority of the lenders, except basically provincial lenders credit unions. So they're basically like the ruler of the land and they set the rules for the banks and any other lenders that operate across the country that are federally regulated. So when they put out these proposed rule changes, you can know for certain that they haven't really backtracked on anything. They're just getting feedback, but I'm pretty sure that they're moving forward with these rule changes. So we can pretty much like there may be some tweaking based on the feedback, but it's pretty much a foregone conclusion since from the past that they're going to go ahead with these rule changes. So as they stand right now, the three main rule changes that they're looking at doing is, first of all, they're concerned about how much income people are using towards servicing their mortgage payments. So they're thinking of putting in place a limit on how much mortgage money you can borrow versus your income. So they're thinking of putting on a cap of 4.5 times your annual income in terms of how much mortgage money that you can borrow. So as an example, if your annual salary was 100000 the maximum you could borrow is $450,000 in terms of mortgage money. And under the current rules as they exist now, you could run the numbers, but you could probably borrow more than that now under the current scenario. But yeah, they want to limit people's borrowing capacity to 4.5 times their annual income. It's similar to the home buyer incentive, which is basically like a shared equity mortgage where the government came out with this program and it still exists today. But basically it wasn't that popular because what happened is that the government would give you money towards the down payment. You would put maybe 5% down, they would put 5% down and it would help you with the down payment. But then when people found out that they qualify, they like perhaps like the part about having their mortgage payment reduced, but they found out through this program, they didn't qualify as much to spend on a property. I guess it's okay if you're buying in an affordable market, but if you're buying in a more expensive market like the GTA or GVA, the programs just aren't realistic. So basically similar to that program, they're looking at bringing in this cap of, of like 4.5 times your annual income because they just don't want people to overextend themselves. So that's in addition to the stress test. Another thing that they want to bring in is for anyone putting more than 20% down on a property, there is some leniency in terms of the debt ratios. What I'm talking about is the GDS gross debt service ratio and the TDS total debt service ratio. I'm sure the listeners have maybe heard of it, but just a quick Cole's notes, like the GDS ratio looks at your income versus the expenses of the property you want to buy, the mortgage payments, property taxes, heat amount, and any condo or maintenance fees. And then the TDS, total debt service ratio, looks at all that plus any debt you might have, like car loan payments, car leases, unsecured line of credit, student debt any sort of debt at all. So right now, if you put 20% down on the property, it's not an insured mortgage. Like you're putting at least 20% down. You could possibly, like if you're a strong overall borrower with like a strong credit score of, of maybe like at least 800, like 900 is the perfect credit score. If you have a strong credit score, good savings and all that, like a good job and stable income, lenders will give you exceptions and let you go above the like standard 39 44, 39 GDS, 44. You can perhaps go as high as 44% GDS and 50% TDS, which can give you an extra at least $100,000 in home buying power, possibly more than that there. And yeah, they're looking, the OSPI is looking to limit how many people can get that exceptions there just to reduce the risk to the overall market. So could affect like whether if you're looking to really push how much you can qualify on a property that 
potentially limit how much you're able to spend on a property there. You can still get the exception, but they're limiting how many can get the exception. So that's another rule change. And they're also looking at perhaps introducing a new stress test. Another stress test for those with adjustable rate mortgages that I talked about earlier, where you have to maybe pass a stricter stress test because the problem with a stress test is was testing people plus 2%, but then prime rate went up 4%. So it didn't really protect people from that there. Now, this is unprecedented times. Like that was the fastest rate increase in 30 years. But I guess they're perhaps looking at introducing like a different stress test for adjustable rate mortgages and also maybe a different stress test for a different mortgage term, like, I don't know, five year versus a shorter term one. Yeah, don't really know what the final rules are looking like. But yeah, once they put out these proposed rules, you can be certain that there are rule changes and they're going to be coming, but we don't know when, maybe as soon as the spring, but these are the draft format. And yeah, I'll certainly everyone know once they're finalized. But yes, definitely speak to your mortgage professional because yeah, it's important to keep an eye on these rule changes and I can, somebody like myself can help interpret it because it very well could affect how much you can spend on a property. So if you've been pre-approved before, definitely get that refreshed because once these new mortgage rules come out, it very well could affect how much you're able to spend on a property. And yeah, just to reiterate, you are able to, for listeners of the show, you are able to do those calculations for them. You know, if when these rules come out, or even just with the existing rules that are already in place, last time we spoke, you're happy to calculate those for those that are interested. Because I'm assuming you already have those sort of spreadsheets and tools already set up in your software, and so you can tell people those numbers instead of us trying to figure out the formulas ourselves. <laughs> yes, exactly. Is that <laughs> to be honest, yeah, it's getting more complicated and, and yeah. complicated, and even for me, it have to it takes me a while to wrap my mind around it. So I can only imagine how it is for the average home buyer. But yes, I would be more than happy to do that. And certainly it can be advantageous to potentially buy a property before these new mortgage rules come in. Because yes, like if you're looking to spend towards like your maximum affordability, these new mortgage rules could chop off how much you're able to afford in terms of the properties. So I'm predicting like once the word gets out and once things have been made official, there's going to be kind of a mad dash for people to buy properties before these new rules come in. So you might try to beat the race and try to find something sooner because yeah, like we haven't seen a lot of this talk in the media. It's kind of just been within the mortgage broker circle, but certainly these rule changes are coming down the pipeline. So certainly speak with a mortgage professional if you're looking to kind of stretch how much you can spend on a property there and it makes sense for you because yeah, there's probably going to be a mad dash and We haven't seen it yet, but it makes sense to get in ahead of that there because we could see tighter market conditions return, bidding wars return once people try to get in. So might as well kind of try to beat that rush that could be happening like as soon as the spring. For sure. Yeah. And it makes sense to get a second opinion, have someone crunch those numbers for you. So even if you did calculate all that yourself, if you're like a DIYer, I do find it's great to work with a mortgage professional to make sure that your numbers are right because they're the ones whose job it is to actually keep up to date on all these rules. They already have the software, the spreadsheets in place to calculate these things as these new rules come out and and existing rules as well. So yeah, I've always been a huge fan of mortgage brokers. Every time we've purchased a house, it was through a mortgage broker as well. And one of the big benefits of that and the reason we chose to go with one is because they are able to actually shop around for different mortgages in the Canadian marketplace. Or as if I just go to like some bank down the street or or whatever, you know, that, okay, you get to see what they offer. And then it's kind of like take it or leave it or you, you know try to negotiate. But this is going to be such a big thing in your financial life. Why wouldn't I mean if you're, you're going to shop around for a five hundred dollar TV, why wouldn't you shop around for something that's hundreds of thousands of you know dollars? Obviously, that's a no brainer. You want to make sure you're getting the best rate on that. So yeah, so thanks for anybody new to the show. Sean is basically the resident mortgage expert on the show. He, you know, he's actually in the industry. He he's an active mortgage broker. And he keeps up to date on all of this and he can crunch all the numbers for you. We did set up a page for Sean. Just if you do want some questions answered, there's no like obligation, there's no fee or anything like that. If you go to buildwealthcanada.ca slash Sean, so just S-E-A-N, you can go there and you can actually see Sean's calendar. You can book a time to chat with him. He doesn't charge anything. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. 
All right, I want to give a big shout out to Passive for sponsoring this episode. They are free to use and are literally the number one tool that I consistently use to manage all my investments. If you've been investing for any period of time, you know how important rebalancing your portfolio is as that's what allows you to consistently buy low and sell high with your investments as well as ensure that you aren't taking on any additional unnecessary risk. Now, as critical as rebalancing your portfolio is, it's actually a manual and annoying labor-intensive process as to do it correctly, you have to log into each of your household's investment accounts and do manual data entry on a spreadsheet to figure out how much to buy of each investment every single time that you have money to invest. And there's always the chance that you make a mistake and miscalculate something when doing it yourself on a spreadsheet. So these days, when I have money to invest, I simply log into Passive, I immediately see what I'm holding too much and too little of in my portfolio, and Passive automatically calculates how much I need to buy of each ETF to get me back to my target across all of my household's accounts. Then in a couple clicks, I can have Passive buy the investments that I'm holding too little of across all my and my wife's accounts without me having to log in and out of each account to manually do the trades myself. I'm also able to see how my entire household's investment portfolio is doing across all our accounts in just a mouse click instead of manually having to add everything up across all my accounts. So they have a free account that you can use to try them out. And if you are a Quest Trade user like me, you also get their premium account for free. So it's a complete no brainer. And I've personally been using them for years at this point. So I can definitely vouch for them as they have literally become my number one favorite tool for managing my investments. They saved me many dozens of hours when I'm managing and optimizing my portfolio. So definitely check them out. They are a fantastic Canadian company and you can get your free account by going to buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. Again, that's buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. And now back to the show. So yeah, maybe did you want to talk to that a little bit about you know, someone that's considering working with a mortgage broker or just wants some questions answered or just wants to see what these different options are with mortgages? Can you speak to you know, how it works, whether you have to pay for the service of a mortgage broker? How does all that work? Just to be all transparent with everything. Yes, I'm all about transparency. And that was actually a perfect segue there. So I couldn't have done it more perfect myself there. But yes, I definitely think it's important, as you mentioned, Cornell, to understand how any financial professional is compensated that you're going to be working with, whether it's realtor, accountant, financial planner, mortgage broker as well. So There's a misconception out there about mortgage brokers. Like even myself, before I was a mortgage broker, when I bought my property a little over 10 years ago, I was working with a mortgage broker and he just didn't explain this to me. So there was like a misunderstanding. I believe he might have mentioned that I didn't need to pay anything for his services, but I just assumed he got a salary. He never explained that to me. With realtors, I kind of had an idea that a realtor only got paid if I bought a property through them because they like asked me to sign a buyer representation agreement and they did a good job of explaining that. But I just find that with mortgage brokers, this kind of people don't always do a good job of explaining that. And yeah, with any financial professional, you want to understand that there. So I just want to clarify with mortgage brokers, we don't receive a salary or anything like that. We're paid similar to realtors. Like when you end up taking out a mortgage through us, we receive basically like a finder's fee or commission from the lender once you end up taking the mortgage out through us. So out like, for example, if you're working with your mortgage broker, you have to take out the mortgage through them in order for them to get like fairly compensated for the time. And yeah, I think it's so important to explain that there because I feel bad working with my first mortgage broker there because I thought he got a salary. And then I didn't know that. I ended up working with another mortgage broker. He was so nice. He spent all this time sitting down with me and explaining things to me and making up like a custom mortgage plan for me to pay off my mortgage sooner. And yeah, I didn't know. I thought he got a salary. I didn't know he was just paid commission. So he was actually upset and he called me up and was angry that I wasn't taking out the mortgage with him. But I didn't understand because he didn't explain to me how he was paid. I thought he just got a salary. So if he had have explained that up front, I would have been a lot more loyal to him. And I wouldn't have gone with another mortgage broker. I would have figured out a way to work together. So yeah, I just wanted to explain to the listeners that mortgage brokers, like I said, were paid similar to realtors. So if I was working with a mortgage broker, I find a good way is the initial 
phone call that you have with them is kind of like an interview for both of you to make sure that you're a good fit for each other. But once you've decided to work together, the mortgage broker, like myself, I'm going to be investing a lot of time in helping you. And I don't like having asking people to design things. Like I said, no obligations. So I kind of work on like a handshake agreement there. But yeah, I just want to explain that up front because your mortgage broker myself is going to be investing a lot of time in helping you. And being a mortgage broker isn't free. I have to pay a ton of overhead costs, thousands of dollars in licensing fees, office expenses, all this stuff. And yeah, I want to be able to offer this great service to Canadians, but be able to afford to cover all my expenses, licensing fees, system access fees, stuff of that, that nature. Like if I invest all this time in helping clients and then I don't end up getting paid at the end of the day, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to stay in be able to afford to, to stay in, in business and be able to keep the lights and the heat turned on. I mean, I don't know about you, Cornell, but I enjoy having electricity and heat there. So I'm just trying to earn an honest living there. And yeah, like I said, it's no obligation, but the way I would treat it is the first initial call is just to figure out like for both of us, if we're a good fit for each other. But once you've made a decision to work with a mortgage broker, if you could just be try to be respectful of their time, because they're going to be investing a lot of time in helping you there. And yeah, just, I just want to kind of explain how we're paid because yeah, I will do everything for a client. I want them to have a five-star experience there, but definitely going to be showing loyalty to the client and trying to respond to them. So if they're able to show loyalty back and appreciate all the time that I've been investing in them and, and actually take out the mortgage with me at the end, I'll definitely fight on their behalf to get them the best option possible. But yes, if they're able to show that loyalty later on, it'd be greatly appreciated because I want to stay in business and be doing this forever as long as I'm able to. But yeah, if, if there's not that loyalty later on and I'm not able to cover my overhead costs, I might not be able to afford to do that. So yeah, I know people aren't necessarily going out of their way to be mean to mortgage brokers or anything like that, but just wanted to kind of explain that because if I could go back in time, I definitely would have worked with that first mortgage broker that helped me. He was so nice, but I really had no idea. So hopefully now that you know, and I just wanted to explain that to you. So if we're able to show loyalty for both sides there, that would be great. And you're able to, in good faith, uh, take out the mortgage with a mortgage broker at the end once they've helped you all that time. That would be great because, yeah, it's just, I would never be rude to anyone like the other mortgage broker and, and call anyone and be upset. Like that wasn't the right way that he handled it there, but I can understand where he's coming from. So I just want to explain this up front so nobody has hurt feelings at the end, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. I know what's worked well for my family and I when it comes to mortgages is, and I think most people do this, is that everyone, Correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but I think just about everyone will still go online themselves and check what the different rates are at a few different sides, just to get an idea of what you know what mortgage rates are when they're considering buying a home. And I remember always doing that, so I'd have kind of my research of like, okay, here's like the best ones I've been able to find. But then I always ended up going with a mortgage broker anyway, because then I can say, okay, well, look, this is what I've been able to find. Can you do something better than this, or what can you do to help me out? And then from that point on, I would actually work you know with the mortgage broker. And every time that we've done that, we've been able to get either a lower rate or even if the rate was the same as like the lowest one that I've been able to find myself, the, the terms that I was able to get were actually better with the mortgage broker. So, because obviously the rate's the big important thing, but there's also like other conditions, right? That can be favorable or unfavorable too. And I would say yeah, every single time that I've gone through this process, I was able to get basically a better mortgage, not just in terms of rate, but in terms of the conditions as well. Then if that I was able to get myself. And at least this way, you're working with someone one-on-one -on -one that's there to help you, right? You're not just like calling some call center somewhere and you're getting a different person each time or whatever. So yeah, I've always been a big, big fan of the mortgage broker piece uh, just because they are able to shop around for you. And then, yeah, then I would just show them that loyalty and, you know, by going with them, because like I said, every time they were able to, you know, at the very least match the price, but always like better terms as well. So no, that's awesome, Sean. Thanks for clarifying that. It's good for, I think, everyone to know how everyone's compensated, right? And yeah, so again, that page for anybody that does want to chat with Sean, it's buildwealthcanada.ca slash Sean, just S-E-A-N, and that will take you there. And then you can basically book a time on his calendar. And like you said, you don't get anyone to sign anything, right? Sean, it's just like, they can ask you questions, even if they're not ready to bring on a mortgage, but at least you can kind of go in there informed. So yeah, well, I do want to thank you for providing that service to the Build of Canada listeners, because yeah, it's something that 
I was like, okay, I need someone that is in the industry day in, day out that keeps the data and all this. Cause like we've already talked today, there's so many rule changes and rates are changing. Like it's a constantly moving industry. And so you don't want to just read some blog posts from two years ago and be like, oh, this is clearly how things are done. They're like, well, hold on, <laughs> hold on. You know, or some book. Like I used to read so many books on the subject. And those are that can be great, but you do want this up to date and someone that's actually in a day to day present day, just because of the nature of this beast, which is that rules keep changing, things keep changing, buyer sellers markets keep changing. And so you do want someone that's a little bit closer with their ear to the ground, I think, with all the most up to date information. So well said. So awesome, Sean. That's all I wanted to add for that one. Anything on your end, or are we good to proceed? Yes, very, very well said. And yes, there's nothing wrong with doing your due diligence there. But the problem I find with these mortgage rate comparison websites is that they don't tell you all the fine prints. And I just find a lot of these mortgages have these gotcha things, mm. bona fide sale clauses that trap you from breaking your mortgage, which six in ten Canadians end up doing. So. I find there, there's just a lack of transparency with them. So certainly if you want to know where the lay of the land, you can check the rates out. But I just find these services subpar. It's, it's similar to going into the bank, not to bad mouth the bank or anything, but they're basically just all about the rates and they do such a poor job of explaining the terms and condition of the mortgage, like the penalty and the prepayment privileges. And maybe they're not doing it on purpose, but they just don't have the knowledge and training like somebody like myself, who's a mortgage broker there. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with just doing your due diligence, just to know the lay of the land, just to know where fixed rates and variable rates are, because you'd have no idea whether they're 1% or 6%. You could have no idea there, but I definitely say working with a mortgage broker makes a lot more sense because they're able to transparently explain all that stuff to you. Whereas you're just basically just getting a rate and it's just basically like buying a car just based on the purchase price without looking at any of the features of the car. I mean, you could walk off in a real junker if you don't look at the important features of the car. It's the same thing with a the mortgage there. It's the single biggest debt of your lifetime. So yeah, that's kind of, I would say just to understand where things are at, that's a good starting point. But yeah, there's just a lack of understanding and you don't really know what you're signing up for. And there's just a lot of gotchas. So definitely a mortgage broker can help explain all that to you because it can be reading through like a legal contract, almost trying to understand that stuff. So I'd definitely say work with a mortgage broker who can clearly explain everything to you because you can end up with, it may look like you have a good rate, but it can end up costing you a ton later on if you have to pay a huge penalty or, or there's other limitations, like you're not able to break your mortgage later on. Mm -hmm. So yes, like what I would say is the best thing to do. Sounds good. And what are some of the ways to qualify for a higher home purchase price, despite some of these new pending mortgage rules that you were talking about earlier? Yes. So that's a great point there because yeah, there are some mortgage rules coming down the pipeline. Now I'll just go over three key ways that you can potentially qualify for a higher home purchase price. Now, if you're in the fortunate financial position to have assistance from family, like parents or grandparents, there are some ways they can help you. First way is gifted down payment. They can gift you some or all of your down payment, which basically whatever money they gift you, that's how much more you can afford to spend on a property. Like if they gift you 50,000 and you only qualify for maybe 500,000 on your own, you can get up to like 550. And if you were less than 20% down before and it bumps you up to at least 20%, you can potentially afford more because you can qualify for a 30 year amortization which is a time that it takes to pay off the mortgage. And because the payment is stretched up more, you can qualify for a higher home purchase price. So gifted down payment definitely helps, but I realize not everyone's parents are in the financial position to do that. If they don't have the cash at hand, they could potentially borrow equity from their property by way of a mortgage or a home equity line of credit, but they're not in the position to do that. Second way is by co-signing on the property, which basically means like guaranteeing the mortgage payment for the lender and including their income there. And I would say that's a pretty common way, especially if you're like a home buyer on your own, and it can be difficult to qualify in these big cities like Toronto and Vancouver to buy a property there. So co-signing is common, but I guess it's just important that you understand that your parents and grandparents maybe, or whoever's co-signing with you, there are credits on the line as well. So it's important to keep that in mind and just you know, treat it as seriously as possible because there are credits on the line as well. But co-signing can help you 
qualify for a bit more and they don't have to put any money up front. Like if somebody has a relatively small mortgage and they only own maybe one or two properties and they don't own five or six rental properties, they can be a good candidate for co-signing. So that's the second way. And a third way that mortgage brokers, we have exclusive access to this in a lot of cases. So I was talking about these new mortgage rules, but a lot of people don't know about is provincial credit unions because they don't have to follow these new mortgage rules. The new mortgage rules are for federal lenders, but for credit unions who are regulated provincially, they don't have to follow these rules. So what a lot of people aren't aware is they don't have to pass the stress test. You only have to qualify at many cases just based on your mortgage rates. So maybe instead of qualifying at like six, seven percent, you could only qualify at your actual mortgage rate in the four or five percent. So that can buy you an extra at least a hundred thousand dollars in home purchasing power right there. And and they as far as 30 five years and you don't even have to pay any extra fees or anything like that there. So yeah, of course you want to sit down and make sure you can actually afford the payments and all that. And you're not stretching your budget too thin, but a way you can protect yourself is keeping a fixed rate so that your payment's not jumping all over the place there. But yes, that is an option that a lot of people aren't aware of. So I would say if you have heard how much you can qualify for and you're not happy, definitely give a mortgage broker a call and we can try looking at other options like the co-signing option. But yes, if you have at least 20% down in order to qualify for the provincial credit union option, then it opens up a whole world of opportunities. So you need to have at least 20% down for that option there. But if you do, then you can potentially go like with a 35 year amortization. And also you can qualify based on your actual mortgage rate, which could easily buy you like $100,000, $150,000 worth of home buying power right there. So yes, definitely if you're not happy how much you qualify for, Culp a mortgage broker like myself, and we'd be happy to discuss uh, other potential options with you. And you mentioned credit unions not having to necessarily comply to those same types of rules. With your clients, do you also look at those types of mortgages where you look at mortgages from credit unions? Yes. I mean, they're not always the first option that we go over together, but yes, in situations where people are really looking to maximize their home buying power, that's a great option that many people even some, many mortgage brokers aren't aware of it themselves, but yeah, that's definitely been a solution. I don't present it to every single client, but in situations where somebody may not qualify for the amount that they're looking for, the provincial credit union can be a great option there. So yes, definitely a conversation to have with a mortgage professional. And we have a lot of tools in our toolbox here. And I work with like 50 different lenders and they all have different policies when it comes to this is not all the same. So definitely there are other options available. So yeah, definitely discuss with a mortgage broker if you're not happy and we can try to see if there's other potential options available. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. That's exactly what I was thinking. This is just another tool in the toolbox that may or may not be the best fit depending on the situation, depending on what the individual wants. So better to have that than not. A lot of people are facing payment shocks right now. If your mortgage is coming up for renewal in the next few months, and you currently are locked into a low fixed rate, you can expect your payment to jump at renewal. What are some things you can do to lower your payment? Yes, great point. As I alluded to earlier, like some people with adjustable rate mortgages saw their payment jump by over $1,000 a month. I mean, imagine $1,000 extra coming out of your bank account for a mortgage. That's quite a bit there. So yeah, there are some things that you can do. So the first thing is, if you're paying your mortgage on a accelerated basis, you could switch to non-accelerated basis. Like the general tip out there is pay your mortgage on accelerated basis, like accelerated bi-weekly or weekly, but that forces you to make a higher payment and be great to be mortgage-free sooner. But if that's really stretching your cash flow so much that you have to never go on a vacation for the next 25 years and eat craft dinner every meal, I don't think that's a good way to live. So certainly you could call up your lender and get them to scale that back to a regular payment, non-accelerated, and that should knock some money off your mortgage payment there. Usually there's not a fee for that there as long as you don't switch it too many times. But yeah, that can be a good, simple way to free up some cash flow without even needing to pay a penalty. Beyond that, another way you can decrease your payment is by uh, stretching out your amortization period there. Now there's a couple ways to do that. You can like switch to another lender and 
basically there are some options if you have a specific type of, of mortgage without getting into too many details called like collateral mortgage. Some lenders allow your amortization period, which is the length of time that it takes to pay off your mortgage in full. They allow you to stretch it out to as far as 25 years and you get best mortgage rates as well because you're not like refinancing your mortgage. So that's kind of a trick that mortgage brokers know about. And we can tell you if you potentially qualify for that option there. So that's that's one option there. Another option is by just refinancing your mortgage and stretching out the amortization period. If the payments are too tight for you, you can basically stretch off the amount of time that it would take to pay off your mortgage in full so that your payments are affordable. You could knock down your payments by a few hundred dollars by doing that. And you can still pay down your mortgage more aggressively. You can make lumps and payments, but at least you have the option of making those payments or not. And if your cash flow is too tight, you can scale them back there. So those are some potential ways. Those are just a few of the ways. And I mean, there are other ways as well. But yeah, if, I would say if you're facing a cash flow crunch, definitely reach out to a mortgage professional like myself. Another thing is like, yeah, if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, your discount off prime may not be as good as available right now. Like some people have variable adjustable rate mortgages at just like prime rate or even prime plus or maybe prime minus like 0.2, 0.3%. But discounts available now are quite a bit better. You could get like prime minus 1%. So just by making that simple switch there, you could make your payment lower and save yourself interest as well. And so yeah, definitely consult with a mortgage professional like myself, and we can see how we can improve your situation to save you interest as well as improve your cash flow situation. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Yeah. Just to make sure I understand, because with these mortgages, you may have to incur cancellation penalties, but it sounds like that is mathematical exercise that you have to do to look into it with a client and say, okay, if we cancel this mortgage now, here is what the penalty will be. But now we're getting, let's say this much less expensive mortgage. And so is it actually worth it once we factor in the fees? And it sounds like what you're saying is in some cases, it may actually be better to break that existing mortgage if you're able to get one that's a lot less expensive. Is it correct to say? Exactly. I would do that assessment with anyone, cost benefit analysis, I call it. And I have some spreadsheets to do that there and that I can share with clients as well. But yes, I would do the cost benefit analysis. But the benefit of the adjustable rate mortgage is that it's oftentimes just straight three months of interest. Where you hear those articles about huge mortgage penalties, it's pretty much always fixed rate mortgages with the big banks. So the benefit of the variable rate, which I really like, is it is just a standard three months interest penalty to break it. So it just gives you that freedom if things change in the future, not to have to pay an arm and a leg later on. So it's not just a mortgage rate decision that goes back to the comment earlier on. You have to consider all the terms and conditions and penalties are a huge thing because mm -hmm. six out of 10 Canadians like end up restructuring their mortgage before the end of the five your term there. So definitely mm -hmm. very important to consider those penalties there and adjustable or variable rate has a lot fairer penalty almost always than the fixed rate. So it just gives you more flexibility. Life is always changing. So maybe your mortgage payment should be changing and variable as well, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point because I think if someone, their whole life, they've always been in a fixed rate mortgage. And so they're just used to these enormous cancellation fees if they cancel the mortgage, they may think, okay, well, there's no way I can get a mortgage even if I get a cheaper mortgage, there's no way that's going to offset this enormous fee that I'm paying to cancel the fixed rate mortgage. But if they're actually on like a variable, if someone else is on a variable, that's a totally different situation. Like you said, it can actually be a lot more reasonable. It's a good point. Yeah. Cause I mean, the, the rates, the penalties, I think for variable, like it can be, what is it like a few thousand even if I remember correctly? Yeah. Three months interest. I mean, it depends on the size of the oh, mortgage of course, yeah. and all that, but yeah. yeah, like as an example, just pulling numbers out of my head. Maybe your penalty might be three or four thousand dollars with a variable, but with like a fixed rate with one of the banks, like your penalty could be like fifty, twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Like it can be quite a difference. We're not just talking about a few hundred dollars. So yes, definitely very important to discuss what your future plans are, figure out the mm -hmm. likelihood of breaking your mortgage. And so you have the right terms and conditions. Cause the problem is when you walk into the bank, they're just all about mortgage rate. They don't sit down and talk about long term goals and the likelihood of breaking your mortgage and other stuff like that. Like I really like to sit down with clients and plan for the future so that they're not surprised later on with these huge penalties. Cause the sad reality is 
Many people learn about these penalties the hard way by yeah. learning a $20,000 mortgage penalty lesson. And that's not something that I want people to, to have to experience themselves. I mean, not to get on my soapbox or anything like that, but that's one of the main reasons I became a mortgage broker to help people avoid situations like that. Because it just finds, uh, it seems to me people are being too much taken advantage of, and they don't understand the mortgage terms that they're signing up with. So, and, and I would like to see the regulators kind of crack down on these big penalties, but it seems to me that the, sadly, the big banks are the ones that are providing the feedback and the OSFI seems to listen to them the most. So they're not in favor of, they make lots of their profits from these big penalties, these big fixed rate penalties. So they're not in favor of getting rid of them. So that's why we're not really seeing them go goodbye. So it's up to me as a mortgage broker to help people navigate the rules as they are. And yeah, like the fixed rate penalties can, I would say, unless you're 110% sure you're not going to be breaking the mortgage, then I wouldn't sign up for like a fixed rate with one of the big banks because it can really cost you an arm and a leg. So that's why I became a mortgage broker to help people avoid these huge penalties here because I don't think it's right when somebody's hit with a $20,000 penalty there. I just don't find it's very transparent at all. And sometimes there aren't even, they don't even show you examples of how big your mortgage penalty but when something happens and you need to break it later on that you discover how punitive it can be in nature. So yeah, I like to help people avoid that because that's not a fun lesson to learn a $20,000 mortgage penalty lesson. Mm -hmm. One clause I remember that helped us a lot and one that I would just from all those the books I've read over the years, one that I remember having on my to-do list, always make sure and tell me if this is still something that exists, but it was to make sure that the mortgage was portable. Is that still around? Yes. yes, it is, okay. but not all portability clauses are created equally. Okay. What I mean is that some lenders might only let you port for 30 days, which is very restrictive in nature. You basically have to buy and sell within a 30 day window. And that's, that's very difficult. If you ask somebody, is the mortgage portable? That's not the right question to ask. You need to ask how many days you have to port the mortgage. I would one that has like 60 or 90 days as long as possible. The second thing is you want to understand if it has port and increase, port and decrease, and how that looks. Do they offer you a blended rate? Do they let you keep your existing mortgage and add a new mortgage? Like if you're buying a more expensive property, because some lenders, many adjustable rate or variable rate mortgages, they say that they're portable, but the thing is they don't have the port and increase, which means Unless you're buying a property and it's for the same amount of money, like if you're buying a more expensive property, you basically have to come up with the extra down payment money yourself. Otherwise, you are forced to break the mortgage. So definitely, like I said, find out about the fine print of the porting. And again, the sad thing is if you just go to the bank, they'll just say, yes, the mortgage is portable. They won't tell you how many days you have to port it. They won't tell you how the whole port increase blending. They won't explain any of that to you. Whereas sitting down and explaining all the nitty gritty of those details there. So yeah, the sad thing is if you don't know the right questions asked, that's how you kind of get taken advantage of. So I like to be upfront and explain all that to people so that they're not taking advantage of because the sad thing is if you don't know the right questions asked, like I said, they won't volunteer the information. So like those are definitely some, a couple key questions to ask when it comes to porting. It's not just, is my mortgage portable? You have to ask for those details there because that's just saying, is finding out, yes, it is portable is not a good enough answer. And just in case we have some listeners that are just new to all this and, and the sort of industry jargon and terminology, the, the portable mortgage basically is just that you're able, like if you move, you're able to move that mortgage to the new property. And so it's not like you have to, okay, we're moving. So now I have to basically break my existing mortgage and get a brand new mortgage. If you have a mortgage that's portable and that's like fine print, then okay, you're able to actually move it to the new property without breaking it, which means you're not incurring these extra fees. So that's exactly. why I was always looking for that. And, but I'm really glad, Sean, that you mentioned that. Okay, it's actually not that simple. It's like there's fine print to the fine print <laughs> where now you have to understand, okay, well, what kind of portability? What are the limitations? That kind of a thing. And I think that's actually, I'm glad we got on this little caveat because that I think also speaks to the point about how, yes, in the mortgage industry marketing, we hear rates, 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 everybody wants the lowest rate. But then you get into these other elements, such as, okay, yes, I would like a low rate, but what about some of these other elements that can potentially save me even tens of thousands of dollars, you know, at least thousands, like, okay, is my mortgage actually portable? Is it the right kind of portable? You know, things of that nature. I mean, that alone can be a huge game changer, right? Like, I mean, because a lot of people do move, they may move within that five years that the mortgage term is, and then you want to make sure, okay, if I do move within five years, 
what's going to happen, right? So sorry if I interject. Oh, no, please go ahead. There's a saying that I have the lowest rate can help save you hundreds, but the wrong mortgage product can cost you thousands. And what that means is that you may save a few hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars from a slightly lower rate, but if it ends up costing you thousands of dollars later on for needing to break it because it's not doesn't have very good portability or, or no portability at all, or it has a really punitive mortgage penalty. It's very important to like look at the long term there and, and look at everything and look at all sorts of situations in terms of what might happen in your future. And that's what I do with clients. I sit down and look at their future plans and plan for the likelihood of certain things happening, moving to a new property, needing to the mortgage for whatever reason, maybe to do renovations, stuff like that there. So I kind of cover all that. Whereas, like I said, not to pick on the banks, but when you just go into the bank, they're basically just give you a rate, take it or leave it. And they don't explain anything. And they hand you the contract, which has this buried in here, but it's basically have to have like a law degree to understand any of this here. So I like to explain it in simple terms, because I just find that the way that it's written in the disclosure documents you receive, it's not so easy for the average person. Even for me, it's complicated for me to understand. Sometimes I have to read it quite a few times. So if somebody like me who's been in the industry many years is having some difficulty understanding it, it just goes to show how hard and how lack of transparency it is. So I like to explain all that to my clients so they're not kind of taken an advantage of later on. All right. Awesome, Sean. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for sharing your expertise and for giving us an update. It's, it's nice to get these updates from you because yeah, things are always changing. Either the mortgage rates are changing or the mortgage rules are changing or the real estate market's changing. And now we can do the home inspection, for example, clause. Like, you know, th- these really, really critical things that I think really Canadians need to know of, you know, whether they are already looking for a home or considering it. It is nice to get a bit of a lay of the land and what's currently happening because it is like a moving, it's like trying to hit a moving target a little bit. And so it's nice to have someone in the industry like yourself. So, yeah, for everybody listening, again, thank you, Sean, for offering to answer questions to Build with Canada listeners. Obviously, if you're looking for a mortgage, I would say Sean's your guy. You know, He's been basically the Build with Canada resident mortgage experts for like quite a few years now at this point. I've never had a single complaint or anything at all. A lot of people have taken Sean up on his offer to help him find them their mortgage. But what's nice too is that even if, okay, maybe you're not looking for one right the second, but you will be in the future, Sean has been kind enough to also still take the time and actually answer your question. So you can still hop on a call with him and he can help you there. And he can also show you his research on basically the, the top mortgages that he's been able to find. And like you heard in this episode, there's so many caveats and exceptions and fine print and legalese and jargon and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, he gets compensated if you get a more, if when you do get a mortgage, you know, if, if you get it through him, he gets compensated that way. So, you know, he's able to basically help you and you don't actually have anything out of pocket yourself. So, like I said, this is why I've every single time I've bought a house, it was through a mortgage broker. To me, it was an absolute no-brainer. You can still do your own research if you want. And, and I did because I'm a big nerd about all this kind of stuff. But even after doing my own research, I was always able to get something better through the mortgage broker. So again, Sean, thanks so much for offering. Again, not just for offering to help people who are looking for a mortgage, but even just to get some questions answered just as a service for free. So I, I do appreciate you doing that. And again, that page is Build Wolf Canada dot ca slash sean so just s-e-a-n anything else you wanted to add sean well thank you so much for the kind words and the build wealth canada listeners are so are such nice people and i love when they reach out to me so certainly don't be shy about reaching out to me but yes it's been a pleasure to help build wealth canada listeners over the years and i look forward to continuing to do that and i'm also excited to announce that i've really been working hard over the last couple of months here to come up with some excellent exclusive PDFs that explain things like the whole mortgage approval process in a simple way, because I'm all about keeping things simple. I don't like all this legal jargon. So that should be coming out soon. So yes, definitely connect with me and I'll be able to get that to you. And yeah, just looking at, at making things simpler, like a PDF on explaining like simple credit terms just to improve your credit score, some basic rules. I mean, I've been telling this stuff to sharing this helpful information with people verbally, but I just thought I would just write it down just as a good reference point. So I'm always looking to make the experience better. And I'm excited to, this is a project I've been working very hard on like for pretty much a, a quarter of the year and pretty much ready to get this out here. And the PDFs look amazing. I'm working with a great graphics designer who's really somehow made mortgages interesting with how amazing (laughs) these graphics are. Like one of the graphics is like 
an iceberg. And then at the top of the ice tip of the iceberg, it has mortgage rates. And then below the iceberg, it has penalties, terms and conditions, prepayment privileges, because it just goes to show the mortgage rates are at the tip of the iceberg. And you have to look at everything that's underneath because they say with icebergs, most of it is hidden underneath the water. So this graphic designer, she's my social media gal. She's just like so amazing with this stuff here. So yes, definitely excited. So be sure to reach out and love to share this stuff. And I always pleasure helping the Build Wealth Canada listeners. And I look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. That sounds great. Well, Sean, thanks again for coming on. Always great having you on. Always nice to have an update uh, like this as well. And good luck, everybody, with your mortgage process and your house buying or selling process. It's it's winter right now but when we're recording this, but things are picking up pretty quickly, I notice, in the spring. So I find this was a good time to sort of have this in your arsenal, have this knowledge so that you can start implementing it and just know of the different things to be watchful of. And yeah, Sean, thanks again for everything and, and for offering the, to help the Build Canada listeners. My pleasure. Thank you, Cornell. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please share it with someone that you think may find it useful. And of course, leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify is always super appreciated as well. I'd like to end with a big thanks to two of our sponsors who, apart from my investing course, literally keep the entire Build Wealth Canada podcast and website free for you. Our first sponsor is BMO ETFs. Do you know why asset allocation ETFs have become so popular? Asset allocation explains over 90% of the variation in a portfolio's quarterly returns. So it's no wonder Canadian investors are turning to these ETFs. Today's sponsor, BMO ETFs, offers these innovative all-in-one solutions with the BMO All Equity ETF, ZEQT, BMO Growth ETF, ZGRO, BMO Balanced ETF, ZBAL, BMO Conservative ETF, ZCON, and more. BMO developed these to help provide investors with ETFs that offer broad diversification, and they're also low-cost and simple to use. These ETFs invest in a number of underlying index-based ETFs and are rebalanced automatically back to your set asset allocation or mix of stocks and bonds. They offer a hands-free approach to investing that is built on disciplined weights to provide exposure to different geographies and sectors all in one solution. BMO actually offers eight asset allocation ETFs, and you can learn more at BMOETFs.com. I'd also like to thank Passive, the investing tool that I use for my entire investment portfolio. You can get your free account in Passive over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash free, and you can see my portfolio and what ETFs I buy within Passive over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash portfolio. Passive is literally the number one tool that I consistently use to manage all my investments as it lets me immediately see what I'm holding too much and too little of in my portfolio and it automatically calculates how much I need to buy of each ETF to get me back to my target asset allocation across all my household's accounts. Then if I want in a couple of clicks, I can have Passive buy the investments that I'm holding too little of across all my and my wife's accounts without me having to log in and out of each account to manually do the trades myself. My other favorite feature is to be able to see the performance of my entire household's investment portfolio across all our accounts in just a mouse click instead of manually having to add everything up across all our accounts just to see how we're doing. They have a free account that you can use to try them out. And if you are a Quest Trade user like me, you can also get their premium account for free. So it's a complete no brainer. And I've personally been using them for years at this point. So I can definitely vouch for them as they have literally become my number one favorite tool for managing my investments as they've saved me dozens of hours when managing and optimizing my investment portfolio. Definitely check them out. They are a fantastic Canadian company and you can get your free account by going to build wealth Canada dot ca slash free again that's build wealth canada dot ca slash free thanks for listening to the build wealth canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca dot